If you were in Jude, verse 24 and 25, and we're asking the question, what keeps the true believer from falling? Uh, and uh, if you uh, were here last week, you'll notice that this is part two. So last week we looked at the epistle of Jude and we asked the question, who, pray tell, is Jude? Well, from Matthew 13, 55 and Mark chapter 6, verse 3, we learn that he's one of the four half-brothers of Jesus Christ. So what did the half-brother of Jesus Christ say about eternal security? Jude 24, to him, to who? That's to Christ, who is able to, what's he able to do? He's able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Who's going to keep you from falling? Christ. And not only that, but he then ends by praising Christ because he's going to do this very thing. To the only God our Savior. He had no doubt whatsoever, he probably didn't know it at the beginning, but that his own brother was none other than God incarnate. To God our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. This is glorious. You can hear the music that should be accompanying that. As we said last week, Jude is, is rejoicing, and he wants us to rejoice that Christ Jesus, who saved you, is going to keep you, is going to keep the true believer from apostasy, that is from falling away so that they don't ever return. The question is then asked, how do we know that it refers to being kept from falling away forever? Well, notice what he says, because we're able, he's able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Now, we, as we were looking at Jude, we saw that he's talking about two completely different groups of people. The first group is a group of people who do fall away from the faith. They followed for a while, and they never returned. Who are these people? Well, they're church people, he says. Verse 4, for certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in amongst you. Now, they're church people, but they're not saved. He says in verse 4, they're godless men. Uh, they also, very many of them, are false teachers. They will preach grace, but their idea of grace is this, is God wants you to have a great life. He's in favor of you. He wants all your plans to work out. If you dream it, that's because God gave you the dream. And if you can just visualize it, he wants you to have it. Uh, there's just no talk of sin. And notice he says here, they're godless men who change the grace of God into a license for immorality. No mention of sin whatsoever and repentance and they deny Jesus Christ are only sovereign and Lord. And one of the things you'll also see about these false preachers is you can never get them to say Christ Jesus is the only way. They just won't do it. Fourth, in verse five we're told that they're so, they're, they're so dead to God that they wouldn't believe in him if they saw a, an amazing miracle. Number five, verse seven, uh, they are many of them sexually immoral. Uh, number six, verse eight, they're accountable to no one. And number seven, if you like numbers, uh, as wicked as they are themselves, nevertheless, verse 16 tells us they, they ignore all that and they complain and fault find when it comes to other people. These are church going people. The church is full of them. They're engaging in theology. It's just false theology. So how do we know that this group will fall away never to return? Verse 7, they serve as an example for those who will suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Verse 4, they're men whose condemnation was written about long ago. Verse 13, blackest darkness is reserved for them forever. What was their spiritual condition, these church people? Verse 4, they're godless men. Verse 12, they're twice dead. Verse 20, they follow their natural instincts and do not have the spirit. They're spiritually dead people in your church. That's why eventually they fall away, never to return. And we saw that Jude 
warned so much about this particular group that some people have called the book of Jude not the, uh, the acts of the apostles, but the acts of the apostates. Uh, he warned about it. We saw that Peter warned about false believers infiltrating the church. Paul warned about it. Jesus warned about it. Jesus said many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Adding in Matthew 7, 15, watch out for these false prophets because they will come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So the first group will fall away, never to return. The second group are those who may stumble many, many times, but they will never fall away. Well, how do you know that this group don't fall away for good? Verse 1, Jude says, these are people who are kept by Jesus Christ. Verse 20, that Jesus will bring them to eternal life. And verse 24, he, of course, he's giving glory to God. That's exactly what Christ is going to do. Which really brings us to our inquiry this morning. And that is, how do you know that you have genuine faith and that you're not one of those who's eventually going to fall away, never to return? And that's what Jude deals with. Look at verse 1. To those who have been called, this is his audience, who are loved by God, the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. It, it, it's as though he's saying, if you're genuinely saved, you're going to respond to the warnings that I'm about to give you. So, how do you know you're genuinely saved? You'll take these warnings seriously. First of all, he says you need to watch your faith's quality. Verse 24. He says that Christ is able to keep you, who's you, genuine converts, from falling and present you before his glorious presence without fault or with great joy. But in the same one chapter, which is all Jude is, he also says in verse 5, though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. They didn't believe, but they were a part of the same congregation. The Bible is, is full of warnings, as it is, and these are warnings not to true believers, but specifically to the congregation, so that those who are true believers will make sure that they are, uh, whereas the others will die in their presumption. For example, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, Peter says, Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you're never going to fall. And he means fall away. So the evidence that you're saved is that you do these things. What things do we do? Now, it's not faith plus doing these things. It's faith that does these things. Well, he just got through listing them. He says, make every effort to add to your faith. This is so that you know that your faith is real. Goodness. And goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. And if you feel that the Spirit of God in you is constantly pushing you in that direction, that is, that you're growing spiritually, he said, you're a genuine convert. Paul deals with how that's going to occur. And he says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? So what's the test that you have genuine faith? That, that, that your faith, is a faith is, has quality? He said, do you have Christ in you? Well, how would I know that? Well, what's the Holy Spirit doing in you? As one old country preacher said, he's not just a hitchhiker. He's working in you, Philippians 2.13 says, to will and to do of God's good pleasure. He's constantly working in you to do that. So the two ways to see that you're one of those who has genuine faith, who will be kept by God's grace from falling, is first of all, the Holy Spirit is constantly transforming you on the inside in the seat of your affections, and secondly, this transformation can be increasingly seen taking place on the outside in your actions. So watch the quality of your faith. 
Does it produce holiness? Does it produce a desire for God both in your heart and in a demonstration of this desire in your life? Notice it didn't for the other group. Verse 4, for certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have flipped it among you. They're godless men who change the grace of God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign Lord. That, that, the Spirit of God is not in them. There's, there's, there's this working, this regeneration that's going on inside of them is, is absent. Uh, so how do you know that you're a genuine convert who will be kept from falling? First of all, he says, keep your eye on your faith's quality. And then he goes into specific things that you should be watching out for, which brings us to point two. Are you keeping an eye that your faith is, is one of quality? And secondly, are you a person that respects authority? And he says that because the other group doesn't. Verse 4, they deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Now, they may not deny him in their catechism. They may not deny him with their lips, but they will deny him as being their Lord in their life. They reject Christ's authority, but they, uh, they don't like authority at all. Because in verse 8, he says, in the very same way these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, that's any kind of authority, and slander celestial beings. Isn't that interesting? There's a, there's a little juxtaposition there. Rejecting divine authority always results in what he calls here polluting your own body. What does that mean? Well, the Greek word that's translated pollute meal means to defile or to deprave your own body. How do you deprave your own body? Well, in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, it says, if you sin sexually, you are sinning against your own body. You're defiling it. And this is always the order, is to the degree to which you deny what is due to Christ, that is, you deny worshiping Christ as sovereign Lord, is the degree to which you will fall into sexual depravity. One precedes the other. Jude says you need to be on guard about this. You know the passage in Romans 1, for it says, For although they knew God, they know God exists, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. So what happened? What was the result of that? Their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And so God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading, there it is, defiling of their bodies with one another. And you and I are living in a culture that is systematically dismantling all the authorities that God has set up. They're dismantling the authority of the parent, of the police, of the church, and of course, of God. So what authority are has God placed you under? If you're a child, it's your parents. If, what if, who, 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 whose authority are you under at work? To make your call and election sure, be one of those people, Jude says, who respects authority, because the other group doesn't. How do you know your faith is real and that you're going to be kept from falling? You keep an eye on your faith's quality. You make sure you respect authority and you watch out for hypocrisy. Look at verse 16. These men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires and they boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. As we say, they totally ignore their own evil and yet they're fault finders and grumblers of everybody else. Doesn't that sound exactly like what's going on in the political scene where they're trying to imprison what the other group that's against them while it's blatantly obvious to the world that they're doing the same things. And Paul's talk, Jude's talking to the believer and he says, nah, you're prone to do the same thing. Jesus talking to his disciples in Luke 12 verse 1 says, be on your guard against hypocrisy. They might have been thinking, well, we walk with you. We talk with you. Why, why would you say that? 
because we're so prone to it. And why are we so prone to it? Because the heart is deceitful above all things. Apparently there's nothing in all the universe that is so deceitful as your own heart. C.S. Lewis said we consciously or subconsciously put forward a better image of ourselves than really exists. The outward appearance of our character and the inner reality that only God and maybe some family members know they don't match. This is hypocrisy. So watch out for hypocrisy. Stay a mile clear of immorality. Verse 7. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve an example of those who will suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Now, I think if I asked you, we'd all probably heartily agree that the sin of Sodom was the widespread acceptance of aberrant sex. But how did they ever get so depraved? Ezekiel chapter 16 verse 49 tells us how they did. This is what it says. Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They didn't help the poor and needy. They were haughty, and they did detestable things before me. How about that? That's what caused it all. They were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. Sounds like a perfect description of the culture that we live in. Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, says, be on your guard that this arrogance, this, this lack of concern, because you, you're satisfied with what you've got in life, doesn't take root in your heart, because if it does, it's going to lead to depravity. Now, notice the specific version of immorality that we're to watch out for. I'm kind of going on a tangent here, but uh, it was an interesting inquiry for me. It says in verse 11, Woe to them, they have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. So Jude is saying, just watch out that Balaam's error doesn't become your error. Now we have to ask the question, well, what was Balaam's error? For I spent some time putting together all the scriptures on this topic. I'm going to try to communicate this without being boring. Uh, I, think, I think it's interesting if, uh, if I'm able to communicate it so that you can follow it. If you don't follow it, it's, it's the problems on my end. There's a fellow by the name of Balak. He's the king of Moab. He's terrified about the nation of Israel because they're marching towards him on the way to the promised land. So what is he going to do? Here's what he decides to do. He's going to get his princes to go to a prophet named Balaam and offer him money to put a curse on Israel. Well, I suppose that's what he thought he would do. Now, they bring this to Balaam. And Balaam says, well, I'm going to have to go to God about that. And he speaks to God about it. He hears from God. And Balaam says, no, I'm not going to go with you. I'm not going to go to the king of Balaam. I'm not going to take your wretched money. And, and, uh, and to be perfectly honest, I'm, I don't care what you offer me, I'm not going to take it. And I'm only going to speak the words that God gives me. That's a pretty good commitment, isn't it? Let's see what happens. Guess what Balak does? He hears this. The princes get back to him. And he says, well, we'll offer him more money then. Let's raise the stakes. Let's... Uh, increase the temptation and um, so uh, but in spite of the fact that they come back and offer Balaam more money this time God slightly changes his way of dealing with Balaam and he says okay I'm going to give you permission to go with them okay but just only do what I tell you to do okay so then he sets out with the princes to go back to the king of, of, of Moab who's going to offer him this temptation and God says you can go but uh, you know, you, you're just going to submit to me well it isn't long after he's left before God has to confront him 
through the angel of the Lord, which is really most people think is a, was a manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, who confronts Balaam because his motives are so impure. We know what his commitment was, is to only do what God wanted him to do. But God happens to read his heart. Now, what is really astonishing about this story is in Numbers 22, Balaam's donkey, <laughs> he, he repeatedly sees the angel of the Lord standing in front of him, confronting them uh, and saying, don't go any further. The donkey sees it, but Balaam doesn't. Now, this is some indication of your spiritual condition when your farm animals are more spiritual than you. <laughs> God then opens Balaam's eyes and the angel says to him, I've come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. God's looking into his heart. But in verse 37, this angel says, okay, now that I've confronted you on that, you're still able to go. I still want you to follow these people. But again, only say what I tell you to say. God's very patient. He knows you're not right with him, but he, he's, he's going to say, okay, you keep going on the mission, but I'm telling you, your heart's not right. Um, so Balaam went with the princess of Balak. Now he said, your path is reckless one before me. Well, what's a reckless? What was he getting at that, the, that, that Balaam needed to correct before he arrived at the king of Moab? You have to go to other scriptures for that. 2 Peter 2.15 talks about those who've left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Boah, who loved the wages of wickedness. So Balaam was, he'd said with his mouth, I'm only going to say the words God gives to me. But his heart was ready to take the money if the price was right. Revelation chapter 2 verse 14 says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people here who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak, that's the king of Moab, to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food, sacrificed to idols, and committing sexual immorality. Now that's a funny thing. When you give in to the temptation, you, you're just going to go all out with it. That's exactly what happened with him. So clearly, Balaam's convictions crumbled under sufficient temptation. And he takes the money and he agrees to curse Israel. How do we know? For Deuteronomy 23 verse 4 says they hired Balaam. God sends him right over there, tells him, look, you need to straighten this out. And just say only what I say, do only what I tell you to do. And he goes there and takes the money. And he left with the conviction to obey God. They hired Balaam, son of Bor, from Pethor in Aram, to pronounce a curse on Israel. However, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loved you. Nehemiah 13, 2 says the same thing. They, the Moabites, hired Balaam to call a curse down on Israel. Our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing. So every time he opened his mouth to curse Israel, out comes a blessing. That must have shocked him. He tries to curse Israel. Joshua 13, 22 says, in addition, to those slain in battle, the Israelites had put to, to, the, to, the de, to the sword Balaam, son of Boar, who practiced divination. Numbers 21, 24, verse 1 adds, and he practiced, also practiced sorcery. So here's, here's the prophet who was once a true prophet. We're not dealing with a false prophet here. We're dealing with a true prophet here. And what happened to him? He's now getting, he, he got directions from God. He went to God. He got directions from God. And now he's trying to get supernatural directions from sources that are not of God. What a collapse. Jude 11, woe to them that have taken the way of Cain and rushed for profit into Balaam's error. As I say, he wasn't a false prophet. He, he, was, a, he, he was a genuine prophet who, who, who had been hearing from God, but he had his price. He had his price. So what was Balaam's error? The Jew tells us we need to watch out for. It's to see that we do not have convictions that crumble if the devil raises the reward for disobedience to God. God honors people who will follow him even if it costs them something. You get genuine believers who never thought that they could commit, could commit adultery. 
who, who, who were actually committed not to do it. But Satan raised the reward. And they found themselves in a situation where a very seriously attractive member of the opposite sex was propositioning them and their convictions crumbled. Don't do that. Don't be like that. Be a person who's prepared to pay the price of pleasing God. How can you know that your faith is genuine? You keep an eye on your faith's quality. Is it producing holiness in your life? Make sure that you're a person who respects authority. Watch out for hypocrisy in your life. Have nothing to do with immorality. And then finally, watch out for that you have spiritual profitability. Verse 3, I felt I had to write to you and urge you to contend for the faith that was once and for all entrusted to the saints. I asked the question, what am I doing for the kingdom? What has God entrusted to me that I'm, I'm about his business regarding? Where am I contending for the faith? And it could just be, you know, that you're, it's something that goes on in your home. It goes on with a neighbor. It's just something where you do, you do your duty and you do it because you know God wants you to do it. So how can we know that our faith is genuine? Jude says that's how. And that's how you know that even though you may stumble many, many times, Christ will keep you from falling. Let's pray.